Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the online edition of the Geneva Trade and Development Workshop, jointly organized by the CPR and the Geneva School of Economics and Management, the Graduate Institute in Geneva, UNCTAD and the WTO. The seminar will consist of a 60 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes of open discussion. During the presentation, the audience may submit questions using the Q&A facility the co-host will collect a few questions of general interest that will relay them to the speaker at intervals. The last 15 minutes of the event will be reserved for an open discussion where participants may click the raise hand button to ask questions live directly to the speaker. For this last session of the year, we are delighted to introduce Dave Donaldson from MIT, who will present exports, imports and earnings inequality micro data and macro lessons from Ecuador. It's joint work with Rodrigo Azao, Paul Carrillo, Arno Castino, and Dina Pomeranz. Dave, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours, you have one hour. Great, thanks very much. You can hear me okay? Good, and let me share my screen. Okay. Um, well, th thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'll be talking today about the impact of trade on inequality uh, with particular focus on uh, study in Ecuador. Um, so I'm gonna now just very briefly try to summarize the paper in, uh, in one slide. Uh, and then of course, we'll spend the rest of the time going through the de details. But at a high level, uh, we're interested in two questions. The first is uh, about exposure. Who is it in an economy like, for example, Ecuador's, who is exposed to international trade, either because of the way that they participate in trading through the export markets or through uh, import related markets? Second, though, going beyond exposure is kind of, in a sense, the incidence of that exposure. You know, just because somebody's participating in trade doesn't mean that if trade went up or down, that that would necessarily affect them more than somebody else, which, of course, is how trade would matter for inequality. So the second question is about the incidence of that exposure. And building towards that, we're gonna to try to proceed in four steps. So the first is gonna be theoretical. We're gonna, in a, what we think is a, a quite general environment, um, try to clarify what we mean by um, exposure, uh, both on the export and import side. And we have a kind of what we think is a novel decomposition or way of thinking about that in terms of export and import channels. Um, we're gonna highlight that what matters for incidents, however, is entirely to do with uh, the domestic economy in a sense. Uh, it's entirely to do with uh, the domestic factor demand system for the domestic economy as a whole for those domestic factors. And that's what will matter for incidents. Um, that statement is true irrespective of what's going on in the rest of the world. So in that sense, uh, the amount of exposure is in some sense a sufficient statistic for the effect, for what you need to know about the rest of the world for knowing about the incidence of such exposure. Uh, so exposure is sort of a sufficient statistic and incidence is something that is more structural and it's inherently about the domestic factor demand system. So we're gonna, turning to the data then, we're gonna first try to measure that exposure. And um, here we're, uh, you know, we're excited to be using uh, what we think is some cool uh, and unique administrative data that's available from Ecuador and a growing number of countries. So in a sense, we're gonna start with um, you know, pretty standard by now firm level customs records and then merge them into uh, you know, a growing number of settings where this is possible, sort of firm to firm trade data via the VAT uh, tax system and the micro data that it leaves behind it. We'll also merge into those firms, each of those firms, uh, be they ones who directly export or not. We're gonna merge in sort of the individual workers who, who work in those firms. That's the uh, social security based or employer employee match data set. And finally, we also know who owns these firms. Um, so that is um, in a sense, a way of getting at the overall uh, effect of, of, um, of trade on inequality, which in includes the capital that people own. We're gonna have a notion of capital that is basically about being an owner in a firm. So all of that's gonna add up to basically say you could take the millions of people in Ecuador and measure for each of them their individual exposure, uh, be they a, a laborer or a capitalist or many people are both of course, uh, uh, their exposure to both the export side of trade and the import side of trade via these channels. 
Um, and then we're going to have to turn to incidents, which, as I mentioned, is inherently about the domestic economy. Um, and we're going to have a sort of particular uh, sort of micro-founded model of uh, where domestic factor demand comes from. It comes both directly inside firms that you know make their decisions about which factors to use inside their their firms, inside their establishments. And then also indirectly, because those firms sell to other firms and also to, to the rest of the world and buy from the rest of the world and from each other. So kind of adding all that up, there'll be some sort of micro level production and utility functions basically that we need to estimate. And it's gonna boil down to just a small number of parameters and a, and a huge set of kind of, I guess you could call them sort of shares, pre-shares that allow us to match all the heterogeneity of those firms and things like which factors they use uh, at any prices and what kind of exporting and importing and purchasing of firms from, uh, from other firms they do at any prices. Um, okay, so, you know, that's a, that's, uh, you know, a highly restrictive and parametric model that has some assumptions in it. And so we thought it was important to pause and do a bit of a test uh, of that model. And we're going to kind of test it in what we think is the most direct and natural way, given the question at hand. The question is, how do foreign shocks uh, like removing trade, uh, that is setting trade costs to infinity, how do those for how do foreign shocks affect wages? Well, that's something that, of course, one can also estimate in sample, and we wanted to compare whether the, the, the responsiveness of wages and other factor prices to foreign shocks that appears in, in our sample uh, agrees with what we, uh, in, the, in the parametric model, based on microdata, what it predicts for the macro equilibrium responses of factor prices to wages. So that's an important test that we think is, um, we're going to show along the way. Uh, but that's all going to build up to a counterfactual that's going to turn off trade. And um, that is go to autarky, you know, kind of a, a, a hypothetical, hopefully uh, counterfactual that's meant to illustrate how much trade matters for inequality in this economy. And what we find is basically that um, the largest, so flipping that around, imagine you were going from autarky to, to the amount of trade that Ecuador is currently doing. Um, we would find that there are gains from trade that accrue uh, largely to top income earners or to higher than median income earners. There's a, in other words, trade uh, increases inequality in this setting, we think. Um, and this could be happening through export related channels or import related channels, but we find that in our, uh, according to our estimates, according to Ecuador, uh, that the import channel is a, is a much bigger part of the story than the export channel. So that's the paper in a nutshell. Uh, let me now just say a few words on uh, how we see it relating to prior work. Of course, there's a vast amount of this work. I'm not going to um, be able to talk about every connection with the huge body of work that trade economists have done on the topic of inequality. But I want to just highlight um, that we have kind of uh, been very inspired by um, what uh, has been referred to as the factor content approach to uh, studying the effect of trade on inequality. Uh, that approach we associate originally with the theoretical insight um, of Deardorff and Steger, and then the empirical application of that insight in some uh, in very important settings, uh, such as Bor Hasadal, um, Katz and Murphy, uh, Adrian Woods uh, uh, studies as, as well. And as you may know, uh, you know, trade economists weren't always um, at peace with the factor content approach and some of the assumptions that were embodied in it. Uh, and so uh, Krugman and Lemer had a, a, a well-known uh, debate about the pros and cons of this approach in the 2000 issue of the JAE. So what we, at core, what we like about the approach is that it, it sort of focuses on the heart of the matter. I mean, you know, inequality is about differences in factor prices and uh, so it seems natural to try to cast things onto the supply and demand of factors. And, uh, and, and in other words, how trade changes the demand for factors um, most prominently. And that's what the original factor quant approach did. Um, I, I would also highlight that it had a very nice connection with the data in the sense that it highlighted certain stati uh, sufficient statistics that would summarize the impact that foreign trade could have on inequality. Uh, however, it did so under some, you know, relatively strong, I think we'd say by, in, by you know, relative to what we know nowadays, um, relatively strong assumptions, such as, for example, countries being inside a cone of diversification so that they're, you know, they're, that, that the, um, that factor demand locally is infinitely elastic, et cetera. 
Uh, and we're going to try to relax those assumptions and instead let the data tell us about the value of those elasticities and find, you know, no surprise, there are a lot less than infinity. Uh, you know, another thing is is just the advantage of, of modern microdata is that rather than having, you know, for example, two types of factors or three types of factors, we're going to have very, very many. And uh, we're going to be able to match those down to individuals in order to trace out the impact of trade on inequality. Uh, finally, we we spotted some places where we think that prior applications of the idea were not uh, particularly careful about how theory got mapped to, to empirical estimation. And uh, we think it's important that that is done uh, differently. So we're trying to make progress there. Um, and then on that note, you know, this ties also, of course, to uh, a, a little bit more of a, um, uh, you know, partial equilibrium, a little bit more reduced form um, tradition in recent work studying trade and inequality, but, you know, really, again, gets to the heart of the matter in a different way, looks at the direct effect of trade shocks uh, on the incidence, uh, on factor prices and, and maybe employment and other things like it, um, by uh, taking a stand on notions of exposure across firms, industries, regions, uh, skill groups, education, etc. And we're basically uh, also trying to sort of find a, a, you know, build a bridge, I guess, between what one can do with those sorts of regressions uh, and map it into broader, uh, you know, general equilibrium, large scale counterfactuals uh, that are not just true locally, but that are true all the way to autarky. And that really draws heavily on the earlier factor content approach ideas. Um, so we see this as um, uh, trying to bridge some of the uh, traditions that have, have worked on this problem. Um, okay, so with that, uh, by way of introduction, I'll start talking about the theory. So uh, for everything I say today, it's as if, uh, you know, all that will matter is as if there were two countries, the home country that you really care a lot about, that's going to be Ecuador for us, and then the so-called foreign country, which is every other country in the world just acting as one, uh, no assumption there. Um, so our notation will be that factors, uh, there's an arbitrary set of them, uh, there's the, the Fs at home and the Fs uh, overseas, uh, the, the foreign factors ha are in the set F star. So for us, factors are going to be things that are in fixed supply. So we'll use this notation L bar F to denote the exogenously supplied amount of um, a factor type F. So uh, the key assumption for this part of the theory is going to be this one, that, that factor markets are perfectly competitive. Um, so that's going to be at the heart in the sense of like, you know, the supply demand approach to factor market equilibrium. Um, uh, so the just our notation for factor prices will be the vector of W's and W stars, where crucially, maybe w, w is the one we care about that that, of course, encodes inequality, the different W's. Uh, and W star is the foreign W's. Those don't matter per se, except that, you know, of course, that's how we index one form of trade is, is uh, a W star. That is the price of foreign things uh, going up or down from the perspective of the home economy. So, as I said, the key assumption is perfect factor, per, per competitive factor markets. Uh, other assumptions, such as where what preferences look like, what uh, technologies, trade costs look like, don't matter. And but surprisingly to us, perhaps, uh, was this one that the the market structure in the product markets also doesn't matter per se. It's 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 really the uh, once you project onto the factor space, it's it's the factor markets that matter. Okay, so um, so talking about factor supply and demand, this uh, is uh, the equation of relative factor demand on the left to relative factor supply. This is a, you know, it look, might look an, like an identity, uh, but it's not. It's a proposition uh, because of the generality of the setup and the, particularly the generality of the product market um, setup, which is general, uh, I think as general as one possibly could be. Um, so I'm going to skip a lot of those details, but uh, if you're interested, they're discussed in the appendix of our paper. So on the left is world or total demand for a given factor at home, F relative to some other factor at home, factor zero. And of course, we're always talking about inequality here. So we'll always talk, be talking about relative factor demand and relative factor supply. So notice, of course, that that factor demand for factor F from, comes both from the home market, that's the first term here, and also from foreigners demanding the home factor of type little f. And L star is the notation for how much the foreigners are demanding uh, of the home factor F. And of course, those two factor demand systems depend on the prices of things at home, as well as the fact prices of things abroad. Uh, 
Uh, they depend on everything. And T is our notation, just to remind us that that's the general in the trading equilibrium. Those are the prices that obtain to set demand equal to supply. So um, we want to just highlight that the, uh, the L star is very complicated. Uh, it depends on everything that's happening in the foreign economy. It's this complicated system. But none of that is really going to concern us because we're just going to treat it as data. We're just going to measure that L star thing. And of course, really doing that is something that um, the ONTF did starting in the 50s, measuring the factor content of exports. That is really what L star is. It's the as if um, factor services from home factor type F that get exported and consumed abroad or demanded abroad. And so, of course, of course the L star function might be necessary for um, some counterfactuals, but we're going to study counterfactuals that um, start from a trading equilibrium and go to some other known point, and that's going to be all about observables. And so we're never going to need to know the L star function. Uh, so for future reference, we would define this thing EE, export exposure. It's going to be very important. It's going to capture the exporting effect in this model. And again, like I said, it's, it's, it's really just L star, but we're going to normalize it by the total amount of sales of factor F in the world. So it's kind of like your, how the share of your factor services exported relative to the share of your total factor services demanded in the world and supplied. Um, Okay, so of course, a natural, just simple corollary of that. This is this is basically just uh, very simple. But uh, we can rewrite that uh, proposition one market clearing condition in the following simple way: uh, the left, the right hand side stays the same. Uh, relative supplies are still simple and fixed. The the left hand side is now relative demand, just written in a slightly different way. Now, what is the ratio of the de relative domestic demand? Notice that's the relative domestic demand system. Uh, multiplied by this transformation of export exposure. It's kind of what we're going to call in a second relative export exposure. So this is now, um, I'll get to that in a second. So this is a way of seeing all that, that, you know, relative supply is fixed. Relative supply is really simple. It's just, uh, you know, we're not, trade is not going to affect relative supply of factors in this endowment world. Um, but it will affect relative demand, and I'll show you that in a second. So this black curve is the relative demand curve. And of course, what I'm plotting here is relative quantities against relative prices. And this is the trading equilibrium summarized by the proposition one equation. So we're gonna sort of, as a corollary one said, we're gonna rewrite um, the, uh, the um, market clearing or the, the, this relative demand in the trading equilibrium here as the product of two things. RD, which will be very important for us, that's the domestic relative demand at the trading prices or at any other prices. That's the RD system. And REE, which stands for relative export exposure, and is, um, is like I said earlier, denoted right here. It's this transformation of those two export exposures for the factor F relative to the other factor, factor zero. Okay, so just, you know, the, the key thing about all this is that, um, the, for the purposes of determining factor prices, if you knew the RD system, uh, that's gonna be a matter of estimation in a second. But remember, this is all about domestic estimation. This is the domestic relative demand system. So if you knew this curve RD inverse, then really summarizing trade, the effect of trade in this world would come down to two sufficient statistics. It would come down to REE, that amount with the two factors are relatively exported uh, in, um, in the current trading equilibrium and W star uh, in the trading equilibrium, which is the current price of those foreign uh, imports. So if you knew those things and you knew how to change them, uh, you could do all counterfactuals in this world if you knew the RD curve. So just to see an example of that at work, we're gonna now talk about uh, this question, how do exports and imports affect inequality? So we're gonna split this up into two. So of course, uh, in general, this is just summarized by shifting the curve. So uh, we're going from the initial curve, which holds in the trading equilibrium, the initial relative demand, world relative demand curve, which as I said earlier, is the product of domestic relative demand and REE, relative export exposure. And going to autarky is really just a shift in that demand curve. And I've drawn this in a case where the shift is actually is good for factor F relative to factor zero. Um, okay, so we're going to split that shift up into two effects, two channels. And again, we, as far as we're aware, this decomposition is, is simple but novel. Um, so the export channel, or, or you know, which another way of saying that is differences in export exposure, um, is going to be a shift in the curve 
but it's only sort of half the shift. It's the shift that turns off the REE. That is to say, it sets REE to one. Why one? Well, that will be the autarky value of REE. We know that both of the export exposures go to zero and REE is just the ratio of one minus E. So it goes to one. Uh, both people are not at all export exposed under autarky. So the way I've drawn this, that shift uh, is, a, is, an, is a rightward shift in the, in, the rel in the relative world demand curve for these two factors. And that, the, in this case, the export channel is good for factor F relative to factor zero. Just the way I've drawn it, of course. Um, so the, uh, you know, this is, if you think about this, this effect is all coming from something the data is telling us directly about whether um, uh, foreigners are demanding these factors differently than domestic people are, uh, domestic firms and people are. So uh, it captures in that sense, a lot of, um, of different phenomena that people have talked about. Uh, you know, the, um, these are just examples of papers that, uh, that stress a particular vector of channel through which trade affects inequality that we would call the, under this definition, the export channel um, and not an import channel. In fact, these papers uh, don't, don't have an import channel. Uh, so just as an example of that, uh, you could take, for example, uh, the work of Antras de Gotari and Itskoki, where uh, you know, they had a Mellitz model where, um, where people were in some way tied to, some people were tied to the firms in which they work or where an entrepreneur maybe owns the firm. Uh, so call that a sort of multi-factor Mellitz model, but with uh, firm specific attachments and firm specific exposure. So we know the Mellitz model delivers selection into exporting. There are some firms you know, that, that make it over those fixed costs and end up doing some exporting and there are other firms that don't. And because of the fact that some people are tied to their firms, uh, the people who are tied to the exporting firms will see their factor services being exported more than the people who are tied to the firms that don't select into exporting. So that's a simple channel through which trade affects inequality because some people export and some people don't. Uh, and, and that in this setup would exactly be uh, an export channel. It just, it just comes down to the simple fact, which is observable in the data, uh, that some people's factor services are getting exported and some other people's aren't. Uh, so turning to the import channel, uh, that is the second shift that I've drawn here. And this shift is also simple. This, uh, when it comes to going to autarky is no more, no less than setting W star to infinity. So this, what you see here is this curve was previously evaluated at the trading W star, and now it's being evaluated at the autarky value of W star, which is infinite. And again, um, this is nothing more, nothing less than uh, really just whether this relative demand curve in the home economy is dependent on W star or not. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of settings where there is no import channel because that relative demand for factors at home doesn't depend on W star. You know, maybe both factors demands do depend on W star, but they depend on W star the same way. So relative demand doesn't get affected by W star. However, of course, there are lots of uh, papers that have stressed examples where the import channel is at work. Maybe the most famous of them all would be the Stolper-Samuelson uh, theorem. But a simple one to think about might be the work of uh, Burstein, Crefino, and Fogel, um, where uh, you know the um, it's the case that inside the aggregate production function um, that firms use, the uh, it's the case that two factors, let's say high skilled, low skilled labor, um, are differentially complementary with imported uh, machines and intermediates. So if that's the case, then of course the relative demand for those two home factors, high and low skilled labor will depend on the price of that third thing with which they're differentially complementary or substitutable, uh, which happens to be imported. And, it's, and so that's a direct and simple example of a pure import channel. Um, okay, so our, uh, our, our uh, main Second proposition here is that in that general environment before, you can always, at least uh, with some regularity conditions that uh, you know, rule out knife edge scenarios, one can always decompose the total effect of trade into these export and import channels. And that's nothing more than these two shifts, which in uh, the language of uh, the integrals are, uh, are you know, integrals that sum over lots of small changes. And if you see here in a sense that the export channel is taking the value of that REE thing from uh, what it is in the data to one or where the, its log is zero. 
And the incidence of that will depend on the, uh, the slopes embodied by the inverse of the domestic relative demand system. That's really nothing more than saying when we shift a demand curve, what will be the effect on prices? Um, the import channel, however, uh, you know, starts with something that is itself a derivative. It's how much relative demand domestically depends on W star, but then feeds that same demand shifter that you saw here into that same uh, kind of Jacobia and the same inverse of the domestic relative demand system as you integrate from the value of W star in the data to infinity, which is where it is under the counterfactual. So uh, I mentioned that this relates to uh, the original, what we call the original factor content approach, um, uh, a la Deodor Steger. This is a visualization of, um, of uh, that theory. Um, and it, it is, it's, it, if, as those of you who know the work will know, you know just how elegant this insight was. Uh, it started from the observation that, uh, you know, if um, we are in a situation where the home country is producing uh, all of the goods that it imports. So in that sense, it's kind of import competing. It's sort of inside the cone of diversification. Then um, uh, it will be the case that that RD curve, the, 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 the trading uh, relative demand curve will be um, horizontal, you know, perfectly elastic locally around the trading equilibrium. And uh, so Deirdre von Steger pointed out that if that's the case, then it will be the case that you can study uh, um, counterfactuals very easily with a sort of sufficient statistical approach that rests on the relative net uh, export exposure of the factors. That is, they pointed out that everything can be studied, that is the effect of trade on inequality can be studied as a shift from an autarky adjusted economy that doesn't have the actual uh, relative supply curve, but has the sort of uh, relative supply curve adjusted by the amount but that factors are being in net terms exported and imported from abroad. That's this RNEE adjustment down here. Uh, and they pointed out that the equilibrium effect of trade can be calculated by simply shifting the as if supply curve over to this autarky adjusted point and then uh, sliding along the domestic, you know, that is closed economy relative demand curve, which of course does slope downwards. That's the red line here. Um, and, uh, and if you knew the value of that slope, then you could, you could move from this point to this point. Uh, and they assumed that this was um, log linear. Uh, that is the entire economy was CS uh, preferences and technology. So they kind of knew how, how to do this. Our approach can be summarized by saying, we're gonna relax the assumptions that, that led to this flat segment. Uh, and make it just the general thing I showed you earlier. That means, unfortunately, relative net export exposure is no longer going to be the thing to keep track of. It's going to be the relative or export exposure that is what you want to keep track of. And then more generally, we're going to try to also estimate the red curve uh, more generally uh, outside a, a, um, a CS setting. And we'd point out in this case that actually in terms of application to this idea, an important point has gotten overlooked, which is that the slope of this red curve is actually quite subtle. It's the slope of the relative demand curve in autarky, um, which of course is not the slope of the relative demand curve in the trading equilibrium that you're observing. In fact, the slope of the relative demand curve in the trading equilibrium you're observing is infinite. So if you did ever estimate and you estimate it and you found that it was less than infinity, you should have been puzzled. Um, but anyway, the right one to try to estimate or build up to is the autarky one. And that's not what uh, existing approaches have done to our knowledge. Um, okay, so now I'm going to kind of just add a couple more restrictions, important restrictions uh, to this setup that are going to let us go from the general results you saw just now that hold under those weak conditions we stated to sort of, you know, a more special set of settings that are designed to help us estimate that RD curve. So if we knew the RD curve, none of what I'm about to show you would, would matter, but it's towards the goal of building up that domestic autarky RD curve that we need uh, these assumptions to help us kind of map to the data and the variation we have. Uh, but as you'll see, it, we think it's quite flexible nonetheless. Um, so this is going to be a nested uh, CES economy, um, you know, generalizes the unnested and common CES economy of prior work, uh, where um, uh, the upper tier will be called Douglas and the lower tier will be across industries, uh, sorry, across firms within industries will be um, CES with this important elasticity of substitution across firms given by Sigma. This is across all the world economies, so it's across both that, that your home consumers are substituting, so it includes both across domestic firm substitution and across foreign and domestic firm substitution. 
On the production side, this is the domestic production technology. Again, the foreign production technologies will never matter, but the product, domestic production technology is going to um, combine uh, primary factors, L, a vector of them that I'll talk about, a bundle of them that I'll talk about in a second, and materials in a Cobb Douglas way. Those materials will themselves be a Cobb Douglas uh, combination of the materials produced by all the other domestic uh, firms in Ecuador, that's the first term, as well as all the uh, firms produ uh, producing materials in the rest of the world that some of these firms might be buying via imports. That's this uh, M, sum over N star term here. And finally, primary factors uh, will not be Cobb Douglas, this will be CES uh, with an elasticity of eta very important elasticity that's the kind of within firm substitution across primary factors. Um, so there's a lot of uh, parametric assumptions here, a lot of Cobb Douglas, uh, a lot of CS, a lot of CS with the same elasticity value kind of in different points in the economy. Um, as well as we're going to stick to the assumption in terms of goods markets that we have perfect competition, uh, which is stronger than we needed for the general results earlier. Uh, so it's important, as I mentioned earlier, that we're going to show you some tests that justify a lot of these assumptions, we, we think, because uh, a priori they might be uh, viewed as too strong. Okay, so building up then to exposure measures suggested by this theory, the export exposure, as, as I've already said, is completely generally, nothing to do with the parametric stuff you've just seen, given by the standard Leontief version of factor content of exports, uh, gross exports, not net exports. Um, and so our uh, export exposure of factor F uh, over here will be in vector notation, kind of this uh, vector product of starting on the right, the firm's uh, vector of how much they export in gross terms to the world economy. Uh, multiply that by the Leontief inverse matrix of the economy, which in our setting will be, you know, the, the general one, the firm to firm one across all the firms in the, in the economy. And then multiply that uh, also by the matrix of factor shares, which is basically um, which factors work in which of those uh, Leontief inverse firms which sell goods to the firms that then export. So this is in the numerator, basically the value of um, direct plus indirect exports by factor F in the Ecuadorian economy. And then as I mentioned earlier, we normalize the denominator by the, that factor's total earnings. Um, uh, okay, so as, as you'd expect, we expect EE to be a demand shifter, to be a positive demand shifter. Uh, you know, the, so if trade makes it go up, uh, sorry, if trade makes it go down for you, then that all else equal is bad. Um, turning to the import side, the, the notion of import exposure in this economy you just saw is actually quite very simple. Um, you know, the, uh, remember, in general, it depends on this complicated derivative, how the domestic relative demand system uh, uh, is elastic to the foreign factor price vector, W star. In this setting, that'll be quite simple. Um, it, it can be written just as this kind of single elasticity, sigma, into this, uh, this kind of factor specific scalar, i.e., i.e. for import exposure, where i.e. basically um, is measuring, um, you know, again, on the, starting from the left, how much factors are in F, factor F is involved in firm N. Um, multiplied by how much, uh, sorry, how much firm N uh, is importing uh, directly and indirectly relative to the average in the sector. And it's the average in the sector that matters because consumers are going to substitute across the firms in these sectors with this elasticity sigma. And, um, and it's that substitution that could put pressure on factor demand if factors work in the firms that are getting substituted away from or towards. And so, of course, if sigma is bigger than one, which turns out to be consistent with our estimates, uh, then, um, then this is a setting where um, uh, a higher value of IE will mean, this kind of uh, means that there's lower relative factor demand. Uh, and so there'll be lower relative factor price under trade for factors that have high, e, high, high values for IE. Okay, so uh, that was it for the theory. I'm gonna pivot now to measurement, but uh, Fred, uh, I'm happy to take a few questions now if you'd like. Um, there is no, no question uh, in the chat uh, as far as I can see. So let me ask a question on, on my own. Quick clarification. So your setting is very general. You, you don't need to make any restriction about the number of factors versus goods and sectors, right? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, um, 
uh, the existence of, of you know, the, as you know, that, I mean, the, the exist in the in the previous factor approach, the existence of a flat segment uh, that is of of um, diversification, uh, you know, does hinge on matters like number of goods and factors. You need uh, number of goods to be more than the number of, uh, weekly more than the number of factors. But uh, but our approach, um, in a sense, sort of is like saying let's just try to measure this black uh the, this um this blue curve and let's not worry about the slope of the black curve because we have two sufficient statistics for kind of how much it's going to shift and so it's actually it's local slope doesn't matter dave can i ask just it's a kind of a silly question but why do you call the second one the import channel um so this captures uh, oh sorry um yeah, so in the general setup, um, uh, well, it, it it's it captures everything through every effect through which um, the price of the foreign factors affects domestic relative demand in the trading equilibrium. Um, so the only way I can think of through which uh, that would happen is through the arrival of goods from the foreign economy. Uh, that is, you know, foreign factor services embodied as goods. So we're sort of putting it in terms of W star, not like P star for the goods price, but that's why we call that the import channel. Mm. Okay. I mean, of course, uh, I'm happy to, uh, as I'm sure you would want us to uh, embrace not just goods, but services and tasks. Uh, yeah. You know, it, I, I don't mean to imply literally just goods arriving at the border, but. No, I was thinking more like price, like the, the export channel is essentially you're set, shutting off any kind of comparative advantage. So it's as if every, every uh, factor is exporting the same amount as every other one, whether it's zero or whatever. So there's no unevenness induced in the economy because of trade. And then the second one is you're shutting off the price effects coming through trade. So that that's, I, I mean, names are what import and export, that sounds cool. So let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, we, we found this this naming a, a helpful expositional device, but I'm I uh, I'm open to we're open to suggestions, of course. Um, I mean, in a sense, one's a quantity and one's a price. That's that's what I was talking about. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, um, and actually, you know, in the original factor content approach, thanks to the fact that the elasticity is infinite, um, both effects work through quantities and and that's how you end up with the net quantity mattering down here. Uh, what we're saying at some level is that the, um, the export one, what we call the export one, uh, is still measurable in terms of quantities. Um, and however, the import one is in general not. Uh, it's, uh, it's about this elasticity of how uh, relative demand responds to relative prices. Um, Okay, Fred, is it all right if I press on? Uh, yes, but in the meantime, Monica is asking a question. Feel free to okay. be sure if you think that uh, you're gonna answer it as you move on. But uh, the question is the following. So why, why does, what does CIS buy you in terms of tractability? Do you really need to impose it? You do it for estimation reasons. Uh, what is the, the main reason you're doing that? Yeah, it's um, absolutely estimation reasons. I mean, uh, the, the the decomposition, the theoretical results that you saw earlier, those are general. Um, but the um, but in terms of building up knowledge, empirical knowledge of this um, of this blue curve, the the autarky relative demand curve, one has to build it up um, some way. And we built it up with a, you know, obviously it's the combination of demand for goods and demand for factors uh, in the domestic economy. And we built it up in this way that, uh, you know, the demand for goods is CS and the demand for factors is also a, a CS production function that generates CS firm demand for factors, as well as, you know, the inputs of other goods, which themselves embody domestic factors as well as foreign factors. Uh, so yeah, it's largely tractability driven. Um, I'd say, I mean, so empirical uh, tractability driven in the sense that we have a low number of elasticities and a lot of shares to estimate, um, you know, more general functions might be more complicated. Okay, so um, 
in terms of exposure measurement, uh, let's go now to go to the data. So uh, this quick summary of the of the data we're using. So um, there's firm level uh, kind of tax data, both corporate income tax data and um, transaction data, uh, where the transaction data includes the transactions at the border as well as transactions between firms. Uh, then on the worker side, uh, everything will come from uh, employer employee match kind of social security records. Um, and on the capital side, this will be uh, possible thanks to a data set that Ecuador maintains of kind of basically which social security numbers or sorry, personal identity numbers of individuals own which firms in the economy. Uh, and uh, that we're gonna use as a kind of an ownership share matrix to map the firm's profits uh, back to individuals. And we're gonna call that kind of a return on capital. And we're actually gonna treat all the many self-employed firms in, a, in this economy, like all economies, we're gonna treat those as labor as, a, as we think is reasonable. But any firm that's hiring somebody else will be treated as a, a real firm with a real capitalist owning it. Um, uh, so I want to, sorry, I should obviously stress, this is about the formal economy in Ecuador. I'll have some words to say at the end about extending our results to, to the informal economy with the help of some survey labor force kind of survey data and uh, broad patterns of our results are, are very much robust to that. Um, okay, so finally, we need to define what a factor is. So, you know, in principle, every individual could be a factor in this world. Um, but we don't think that's particularly realistic because we think that, you know, that in production, it's natural that um, some person is substitutable for some other person of a, a similar type. So that's, of course, the notion of a factor is which people are perfect substitutes for each other in production. Um, the, uh, the way we're gonna do this, uh, and another reason to be interested in testing uh, that we show you in a bit is um, to have a notion of labor types of capital that basically we think is um, inspired by a lot of recent uh, evidence in the literature. So we're gonna have a different type of labor capital for every province of Ecuador. So that's a geographic notion that means that people are not supplying their labor perfectly elastically across geographic regions. And also across three education groups so that you know high skilled laborers are applying different factor services than low skilled, uh, sorry, high school educated more than are applying different factor services than say college educated. Um, Finally, uh, in terms of capital, we Ecuador is a big oil exporter. All that oil exporting is done by a state-owned firm whose profits are no, don't accrue to any individual owner in the economy, they accrue to the state. But nevertheless, we didn't want um, all capital to be bundled into one. So in a sense, we keep oil capital separate from non-oil capital. I guess a micro foundation for that is that um, oil capital, oil rents, oil profits are presumably largely determined by resources in a way that other capital rents may not be. Okay, so this is a picture of export exposure uh, across the income distribution. Uh, this is obviously built up from, as you saw earlier, the factor content of exports of every individual in Ecuador, every formal sector individual. Uh, so to my knowledge, this is the first time a picture like this has been computed. Um, we're, uh, we're able to take, you know, for sort of every percentile of the income distribution based on people's total capital plus labor earnings, uh, and plot their export exposure. And uh, I'll be honest, first of all, I was surprised by the lack of variation here. This thing only varies across the percentiles between sort of 14% and 17%. Um, I was also surprised by the broad shape that it's kind of pro middle class, or if anything, um, a little bit anti, anti rich. Uh, it's lower for high income people. Uh, again, I, I, my prior would have been that high income people, maybe top income people would have benefited a lot from exporting uh, or be doing a lot of exporting and it, here they're not in this country and this data. Um, so this is, you know, but nevertheless, broadly consistent with a Heckscher lean thinking that, you know, it's a country that is in, endowed with um, perhaps, you know, maybe plausibly relatively low skilled workers relative to the wider economy and, um, and as such it's exporting low skilled labor services more than high skilled labor services. Um, okay, so turning to import exposure, uh, this, this one's a little bit simpler. It's kind of broadly downward sloping. Um, so that means that it's very pro-rich. Uh, remember, you don't, you don't want to be import exposed, at least if sigma is bigger than one, you don't want to be import exposed in this world. Uh, that means imports are kind of displacing the demand for your labor. The rich here are relatively immune to that. Um, 
uh, by the way, I should have said that the red and the blue curves in this is just the distinction between uh, total income, which is shown in blue, and labor only income, which is shown in red. So the difference between them is capital earnings. I should have paused to discuss that. So no surprise, there's a lot of capital owned by the rich at the very top. And uh, there is a bit of a distinction between export exposure based on capital and based on uh, labor. Uh, but the overall effect of that on the income distribution is not very big. And the same is true for import exposure over here. Um, okay, so uh, this, uh, you know, I think is broadly against, uh, contrary to your standard Heckscher lean thinking, but we, you know, in the, in the data, what it's being driven by is the fact that most of Ecuador's imports are in intermediates, uh, sorry, in, in intermediates into production, not final goods. And uh, those are used in firms that, um, that tend to employ higher paid people, higher skilled people as well as the capitalists who own those firms. And um, all those reasons put together make this thing downward sloping. Okay, so um, turning towards uh, uh, parameter estimation, everything there was just in a sense, just read off of shares in the raw data. Um, we have two parameters to estimate, sigma and eta, remember. So sigma, so eta is the elasticity of substitution across factors, primary factors of production inside firm production. And this is just CS uh, factor demand estimation, but at the firm level. So it's just your standard thing where we're regressing the factor expenditure on a factor price uh, with a fixed effect to control for the price index. Um, and we're also gonna include a, a factor fixed effect uh, as well. Um, the, uh, of course, like all demand, demand estimation, this would be biased by simultaneity concerns. Uh, so we use instruments and we, we get inspiration from these instruments from the kind of shift share uh, approach to using foreign shocks to try to get uh, variation in domestic prices that can be used for demand or uh, other estimation. So, and our, our notions of uh, instruments are going to follow naturally from the exposure measures you just saw. They don't have to, but uh, but we thought it was useful that they did. Um, so E hat will be an, a, a sort of an export exposure based instrument. I hat an import exposure based instrument. These will always be the same export exposure thing you just saw at the factor level, but now for their exposure to the exports of product V. What is a product? It'll be an HS6 product in this kind of setting based on the trade data we have. So some factors are exporting a lot of HS6 product, you know, V1. And uh, so when the world price or world demand, I should say, for export product V1 uh, goes up, that plausibly puts pressure on the factor prices of the factors that are exposed to that type of exporting. And that's the logic behind the first stage of this instrument. The import one is analogous, but on the import side. So based on that, we obtain estimates, you know, the instruments are kind of uh, past standard checks for uh, strength. Um, and the estimate of eta that we obtain in a baseline is around two. So, you know, bigger than Cobb Douglas, but not a lot bigger than Cobb Douglas is, uh, is, of course, what two means here. And I won't have time to discuss all the details of this, but we've uh, explored a lot of different uh, variations on how one does that. Um, the, uh, that include varying the instruments, uh, varying the sample of firms, varying the variation in terms of whether it's a balanced or unbalanced set of firms, et cetera, et cetera. And we pretty much always end up with a value that's close to two. And um, so we're gonna use this value 2.09 in our counterfactuals. Turning to the only other elasticity of substitution, uh, the one across firms in inside an industry, but in domestic consumption, final goods consumption, uh, we called that sigma earlier. And of course, estimation is the same. Uh, it's standard CS estimation of total sales uh, by firm N, final sales to the domestic economy on, on by firm N on its price. The only wrinkle here is we don't observe that price. Uh, there's no prices in the tax data except factor prices uh, and foreign prices that we observe at the border. Um, so we have to kind of um, use the model to back out in a sense the prices that firms charge when they sell to the domestic consumer. This of course uses perfect competition. It's basically like setting price equal to marginal cost and saying the price of marginal cost is something that we can infer by feeding it through the Antioch inverse and get those marginal costs back into the, not the, the prices of goods in the economy, but the prices of factors, as well as foreign things whose prices we also observe. Um, okay, and then again, we need instruments, but again, uh, it's natural to uh, want to estimate those using foreign shock variation, given that this is a trade paper that's gonna study the effects of foreign shock variation. So the instruments are similar, except now they're kind of firm 
aggregations across the factors that the firms use in some base period. Uh, but otherwise, it's essentially the same idea. Uh, we also do something analogous, but on direct imports by the firm of foreign goods, as, as other people have, have done in the literature, of course. Okay, so uh, turning to those estimates, uh, we get an estimate of, again, around two. That's, of course, a total coincidence, but um, uh, maybe not totally out of line with your priors on an elasticity of substitution across firms in an industry. Um, uh, and again, we've explored lots of variations of ways of doing this uh, and, and end up with values that are always kind of somewhere between uh, about 1.5 and about 3. Uh, so we're going to stick to our, our preferred value of 2 in, in what follows. Okay, so um, that was, Fred, where I plan to pause again. Um, so I'm happy to pause for a few minutes, uh, cognizant of the fact that I have a little bit more to get through here. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions, um, but I guess we will not lose um, much by waiting for the Q&A because, um, yeah, uh, I, I think they are mostly clarifying questions and they might also lead you to digress a bit too much. Those are not so much clarifying. So let's reserve them for the Q&A. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll, um, I'm sorry for not being clear enough, uh, but I, I love, obviously I'd love to discuss those afterwards. Um, so as I said, we, um, you know, we've just specified this you know, very particular demand system, um, uh, uh, you know, demand for factor system derived from goods and factor demand. Uh, and as Monica asked, you know, you know, what's the motivation for that? It, it's not kind of computational tractability. It was driven by empirical dimensionality reduction, really. Um, but so it's important to pause to kind of test some of those points. So the first is that, you know, as you'll have noticed inside the production function and the demand system, we imposed that the upper tiers were always Cobb Douglas. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, very special. So it's kind of, it's important to pause to look at that. Um, doing so is kind of easy. You know, we, we basically just need to, regress um, the share uh, of, so for example, when it comes to uh, consumer demand, we said that the upper level was, was Cobb Douglas. So that of course means that the total amount that consumers are spending on a given sector uh, S does not under the Cobb Douglas null respond to the price index in that sector. So that's like saying that this parameter under our null, uh, under our parameter model would be, would be zero. So we can test that. Same for inside the firm, uh, we assume that uh, imported uh, versus domestically sourced, that is from other firms, uh, intermediate inputs was also Cobb Douglas. And again, we can test that by asking whether beta import is zero or not. And um, finally, we can do the same thing for the decisions the firms were making across which domestic firm to buy from. Uh, that, that one we can also test. Um, so you might call this estimation, you might call this testing. There's a slight distinction because for some of these, we don't quite have the price, the right price data on the right-hand side to do full estimation, but everything we're doing here is consistent under the null. So, uh, so it's kind of testing, uh, not just consistent, but it's, it's the correct thing to do under the null. So I mean, okay. So these are the results of the tests and, uh, these numbers all being close to zero is what reassured us that we didn't need to worry too much about those upper level Cobb Douglas assumptions. These things are all kind of even incorporating confidence intervals pretty close to a zero, close to Cobb Douglas. Turn into what we call more of a macro test. This is this sort of has much more meat to it. This is really asking whether the structure of the model, including the competitive assumptions in the goods and factor markets, embodied in this RD inverse system, which we've now estimated, basically it came down to these parameters and a bunch of pre-shares, whether that thing can, ma can kind of match the data. So we're gonna do this locally, uh, you know, lots of year by year small changes um, where we feed in the observed changes in the foreign shocks, W star and RE, kind of multiply them through by our RD system uh, and get a predicted change in the factor prices. So we can call that whole right-hand side kind of predicted factor prices. And basically, we can regress that on actual factor prices and ask whether the coefficient in front is equal to one or not. And um, obviously, you need to use IV for this too, for the same reasons as before, that the error term includes things that are domestic shocks that might be correlated with these foreign shocks. Um, okay, and so these are the results of our kind of macro test, again, a test for the entire structure of the model. Um, and uh, again, we were you know, reassured by this, that the, the raw baseline has a coefficient of one. If you throw in a whole bunch of controls so that 
this uh, or a fixed effect so that this is exploring the variation you know across different types of factor groups as in other words the fit isn't purely being driven by high skill versus low skill it's also being driven by lots of other dimensions of fit uh, we were reassured by this and something I don't have with me here but it's in the paper is um, you know that if you were to explore this this fit under other values of the micro parameters it would it would start to fail uh, pretty quickly and so we think that it has this test actually does have power um, okay so turning to counterfactuals this is as I said earlier on now kind of really simple because uh, all we're doing is saying this is the observed trade equilibrium this is the counterfactual trade equilibrium the only difference is that the things in red have changed this re is going to one and this w star is going to infinity uh, everything else is constant because uh, it's domestic stuff that's staying constant and so here's the results of our counterfactuals so the left is the export channel only then here in the middle is the import channel only and here on the, the sum of the two which of course is the total impact so what we see is that you know the export channel, these, by the way, of course, take the shape of the exposure things that you saw earlier. And for good reason, because the exposure was the local version of these channels. And so this is just the large change going all the way to autarky effect of those two exposures. Um, okay, so we see that you know the exported channel was anti-rich and the import channel was pro-rich, but what gets revealed is that the import channel is bigger quantitatively than the export channel. So the total effect ends up being pro-rich. That is to say, anyone higher than the median, all these figures are normalized so that the median is the reference factor. So it's always got a zero coefficient on it. Um, everyone else is relative to that median. So but what we see here is that sort of in a sense, everybody above the median is gaining more from trade in Ecuador than the median guy is according to these counterfactuals. And those effects can be substantial. So, you know, the 90, 50 gap can, go, can be predicted to go up by uh, around 12% in this number here. And as you see, the blue again is total income, red is labor only. So a lot of that effect at the top is driven by capital, as I told you earlier, it, it would be. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip this um, in the interest of time. An important thing we wanted to be able to check was uh, how sensitive those results are to the fact that they're only about the administrative tax data. And so they're only about the roughly 50% of individuals in working individuals in Ecuador who appear in the, in, in the formal economy that gets tracked in our admin data. So we drew on this kind of labor force survey run by the National Statistics, uh, the Office of National Statistics, um, to redo the calculations uh, under the, the kind of an extended model that now includes the informal economy. I don't have detail, time to go into all the details, but basically this, uh, the data allows us to fully kind of match the earnings of all the different factor groups in uh, every sector of the economy, both in the formal sector and in the informal sector. So we kind of keep the formal sector as it was coming from the admin data, but now add that informal sector coming from this new survey data. And what you see is that the broad qualitative messages are similar. The export and import channels kind of have the same shape as does the, therefore, of course, the final effect. But the main distinction is that um, uh, kind of it's when you go above the 90th percentile, when you're really looking at the effects of capital that um, the, uh, the survey data tells a different story. It tells a, much, a, a bigger effect uh, on inequality at the very top on capitalists, uh, driven by basically the presence of the informal economy, which is not very capital intensive. And basically what this is coming about from the fact that it's just that these capitalists who are broadly in the formal sector, uh, once you extend the model to include the fact that there's a whole body of labor out there that they could be using Instead, in, in under counterfactuals, uh, they, um, that that uh, that benefits the capitalists uh, more than if you had not included it, uh, which is the line in blue. Um, okay, so the final thing we do is is a different counterfactual, but um, is in a sense a sequence of counterfactuals. So um, this is motivated by the fact that Ecuador has had a, um, a, a pretty sizable drop in. Um, inequality over our sample period, which is uh, 2009 to 2015, uh, roughly the last decade. So for example, the 90-50 ratio in Ecuador has fallen by 18 percentage points in the last, uh, in, over the, that seven year period. Um, so we wanted to ask, well, 
you know, would it have been different if Ecuador were closed to trade instead of being the actual open economy that it was? And that's what's shown in this last column here. And what you see is that, you know, that number, for example, 18% being the reduction in this notion of inequality in the factual equilibrium would have been smaller if Ecuador were closed to trade. So that's like saying, you know, previously we see here that uh, in, the, in this year, which was uh, the midpoint in our sample, 2012, we saw that, um, that openness was a force to kind of increase inequality. Uh, however, that force to increase inequality has been evidently, according to these results, getting smaller over the last seven years. So that's to say the actual reduction in inequality would have been smaller if Ecuador were not trading throughout that time period. Um, okay, so that's where I'll stop. I'll just conclude by reminding you that, you know, our goal here was to um, uh, talk about how trade affects earning, earnings inequality by splitting things up into kind of um, exposure and incidence, and then splitting both exposure and incidence up into export exposure and import exposure. And, um, you know, the motivation for that was partly driven by the fact that one of those exposures, the export exposure, is directly measurable in the data if you have the factor content or trade kind of data of export kind of data that we that we built this paper around. Um, the import exposure one is inherently uh, more about local you know, elasticities uh, to the prices of foreign things. So that involves estimating that domestic uh, relative demand system and, um, and using it to study import exposure. And our findings suggest that you know, uh, perhaps contrary to a simple actual lean view, uh, in the trade has made inequality uh, go up in Ecuador relative to what it would have been, uh, what it would be under under autarky. But that effect is largely concentrated on above the median and particular at the very top, and in particular because of the import effect that benefits capitalists. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thanks again for um, the invitation to be here. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation, which I found very clear. So the questions are not about clarifying per se, but uh, you'll see. So we have um, uh, four questions for the time being. So let me start with uh, Dorothy Henrik. So Dorothy, if you're still around, so please, please shoot. Okay, if not, uh, let me ask the question myself. Uh, Hello, yeah. can you, can you oh, yeah. hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please, the floor is yours. Um, hello, can, can you hear me? Okay, yes. um, so yeah, hi, uh, thanks very much for that interesting presentation. I, I liked it a lot and I look forward to reading your paper. Um, my question was about firms that import and export. Um, so you mentioned that firms that import, uh, for example, import intermediate goods and employ high skilled workers. And that immediately made me think whether they produce particularly for the export market, maybe. So how do you treat that? And how, does, how would that affect the exposure to, to trade and to imports and exports? Thank you. Thanks, yeah, that's a great point. Um, the, uh, I don't think that's happening much in Ecuador. Uh, the um, you know it's it's a it's an economy that largely exports primary products. Uh, you know, oil, uh, bananas, fishing products account for a large share of total exports, um, but imports uh, manufactured items that are probably largely um, that, you know that look largely like intermediates. Um, so, you know, however, if that what you just said was happening, that would be totally fine. That, that's completely allowed for in the general model. It's completely allowed for in the parametric model. The parametric model allows firms to be doing kind of any bespoke amount of importing various things from various countries and selling them to any domestic firm and or the final consumer and selling them to any and selling their product to any foreign country as well, you know, so it's, um, so it's completely unrestricted about those things. And then in terms of factors, yeah, that would, of course, uh, generate the offsetting thing you just, you just mentioned that a given factor could be both, um, uh, in a sense, import exposed and export exposed, but that again is totally allowed for. Um, okay, thank you. So Daniela de la Cresces had a question, so but, um... Can you all, uh, okay, so let me see whether I can find the question back. Yeah, what kind of label would be included in order? So you have this. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, 
I should have paused to say that, I'm sorry. I, um, the other is just a residual category uh, that we need to, um, so the way we learn people's uh, education, for example, is from the so-called, that actually doesn't get reported in the um, social security data uh, in Ecuador. It does appear in a different data source called the so-called civil registry. But um, some people, we, a small number of people, we weren't able to match between the civil registry and the social security data. So uh, in other words, there are some people whose education we don't know. And uh, we put those people in a residual category. Uh, and that's why, um, there's sort of an other. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, we have uh, Richard and Monica. So Richard. Dave, thanks. I, I just wanted to ask if you had looked to see whether tariffs might be able to correct some of the increase in inequality due to trade. Thanks, yeah. Um, we, haven't, we haven't done that, but that's a great idea. Uh, um, so what I, I wanna just, certainly need to highlight one you know, limitation of this setup, uh, which is that uh, by being agnostic about the foreign economy, it inherently means that we can only study counterfactuals that um, lead to a known change in REE and W star. So any, any known change will do. Uh, and we showed you one that takes RE to one and W star to infinity, but any other change would be fine, uh, would be totally feasible and totally easy to do. Uh, but the only subtlety is, you know, we would have to know how a given tariff change, uh, you know, to do your exercise, we'd have to know how a given tariff change would lead to changes in REE or W star, which wouldn't be trivial. Um, Oh, you could use quantitative restrictions instead of tariffs, make it a lot more direct. <laughs> yeah, uh, voluntary export restraints would be super easy to do <laughs> because as you noted earlier, the export one is just a quantity-based measure. So we would just put a cap on it to handle VERs. Um, and W star, you know, I guess under a small open economy um, uh, assumption, which we haven't made at all, but if maybe it's not a crazy thing to assume for Ecuador, then, you know, that might be a case where the proportional under, a, you know, an assumption about perfect pass through uh, the a proportional change in uh, tariffs would lead to a proportional change in W star. W star should, of course, be interpreted as the price that the domestic consumers pay for um, uh, the foreign goods. And of course, with perfect pass through that would just, the change in that would just be the change in the tariff in a small open economy. Um, I guess the, the other subtlety though, that that example highlights is that we know that kind of in equilibrium, it's likely that when you change tariffs, you're not just changing the price of the things everybody's importing, but you'll also uh, via equilibrium uh, change demand for exports, you know, and so that would then complicate the exact, you know, which VERs would bind on the quantity side if we were to do that. But anyway, so the, the bottom line is there's, um, you know, for any, we can do counterfactuals that involve direct changes in those things, uh, but some policy changes might not. You'd have to assume more and estimate more to know how those things would change. Just in case I... I misreported uh, Monica's earlier question. I want to give her the opportunity to uh, to rephrase uh, the question with her own words. It's not really misreported, but so first, thank you, Dave, for this fascinating presentation. Um, so coming back to my earlier question, uh, I see you are impose you are assuming these uh, making the assumption about CS and Cobb Douglas to uh, reduce the dimension the, the dimensionality. And uh, I mean, it's very elegant and you made a very strong case in checking it with data that these assumptions are kind of not uh, crazy assumptions, but I was just wondering precisely by reducing the dimensionality, um, are there any implications on your estimation of the effects going in either like being overestimated or underestimated if you allowed for variable elasticities? I mean, the problem would be huge and probably non-tractable and uh, I mean, much more complicated, but do you have any intuition about which direction it would go? And then I had another question related to what Richard just asked uh, before. Uh, what are kind of the policy implications of this? So Richard asked explicitly on tariffs, are there any other, would there be any other policy implications on uh, about the impacts of trade on the uh, on uh, income uh, distribution? Um, 
Yeah, so on your modeling point, um, I, one, I, there's lots to think about there. And so I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have very good answers, but one that, uh, that seems easy to, for me to talk about would be, um, you know, the import uh, exposure measure, uh, which of course is a local approximation to the model. So it's also, um, uh, sorry. So it's also, you know, speaks to the, the workings of the model. Um, let me just move this thing. Um, so the, uh, you know, this, this says that this, um, this notion of IE, which is, you know, kind of just basically, you know, are you, are you a factor that's sitting in a firm that's going to um, see its, uh, its costs go up or down uh, when imports prices go up or down? Uh, this, of course, matters for domestic demand for those factors because consumers and other firms, sorry, consumers are going to substitute away from or towards those, those firms, which and hence away from the factors that those firms employ. That's what's going on in this equation. So I guess that's always true locally for any, well, there's a sort of a summation here, but you know, for inside every firm for every factor purchase, there's um, an elasticity there. And so one place you can see is that we've, um, thanks to Cobb Douglas, a lot of these things sum. And then thanks to the fact that there's a common sigma, the, the sigma factors out. And so if we had different, elast different but constant elasticities everywhere, you, you'd start to see the distinctions kind of inside the sum as well as uh, um, you know, inside this sum and inside this sum. Uh, however, then those would be true for the whatever value is the elasticity locally. So then obviously CS, that means the elasticity is that value everywhere. But under your VS example, uh, you know, the elasticity would be changing. So, um, and I guess that just helps us think it through. So if the elasticity is falling because we're in one side of CS, then uh, we know that those um, import exposure shocks will be less important uh, for RD than otherwise. But if the elasticity is rising, we'll, we know they'll be more important. So it's, I guess, you know, it, 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 I guess it relates to the, the typical intuition about pass-through that when a firm's marginal costs go up, how much do we expect its price to go up? This is a competitive model. So actually price equals marginal cost anyway, but, it, but, um, but still, of course, there is a demand curve that's downward sloping. And if that demand had different elasticities at different points, we'd see different amounts of pass-through. And hence, and, and pass-through is what matters here for how the shock affects the wages, because uh, uh, that basically is um, all here in the relative demand, um, which then gets multiplied by the, you know, the incidence function, which is the inverse of the domestic demand function to figure out how, it, how this demand shifter affects wages. Um, okay, so that's how I'd start to think about that example. Um, uh, yeah. You know, but more generally, I, I guess maybe uh, a natural, since you mentioned VES uh, versus CS, of course, I'm used to thinking about that in monopolistically competitive settings, uh, as I, you know, you are, you are too. So uh, there, um, you know, this, the same logic goes through. And so actually, I think our paper would be unchanged if um, we had assumed monopolist competition with CS instead of what we have, uh, which is perfect competition with CS. You know, the, um, these, uh, the, the, the fixed entry, um, when, it con when it concerns factor demand, the, the fixed entry here um, at the aggregate level uh, and fixed factor demand makes those two isomorphic. So, um, and then, of course, the intuition is that it's not the fact that there are markups in the economy. It's, of course, what does the presence of those markups imply for relative demand for factors that, that is what matters here. Um, anyway, but if the markups are changing and it's changing in different ways for different factor groups, then that would basically act like what I just said, differential pass through for different factors. And hence, there would be impl different implications for inequality than what we have. Um, and then you mentioned you asked about policy. I mean. Um, I I, uh, I was surprised at how um, one thing I didn't have time to say, but let me just say it now. In this model, um, you know, which we think approximates the data pretty well, uh, uh, it was the case that these exposure measures. Um, this is the thing I skipped uh, here. That these exposure measures. Um, alone, so this is a within the model regression. So we're regressing the model's prediction about the total change of an individual, 2,000, 2.6 million individuals here. Um, the total change of an individual's income 
in the model going to autarky regressed on that person's export exposure and import exposure. I remember the export exposure, they're defined in the model, so you'd expect them to do well, but they're only local derivatives. So it's kind of an open question, how well will they do when you go all the way to autarky? But the R squared here is, nine, is 0.9. So it's saying that like um, these two measures of exposure are gonna capture really well uh, who, uh, you know, incidents as well as exposure of even large shocks in general equilibrium. Um, and so, uh, so that to me has this kind of indirect policy implications. It sort of says that, you know, if we knew who was exposed, uh, then we would know that like, if we're doing a policy that affects REE or um, W star, um, and there's lots of policies we can think of that would affect those things, then we know who's gonna be uh, affected. Uh, it's the people who currently have the exposure. Uh, that's what this, this model is saying. Um, and in some sense, it's what the reduced form of our tests are saying too, is that, um, these same exposure things on a year to year basis uh, do predict changes in wages in the, in the same way the model predicts. Um, okay, so that's, that's, I think, you know, what I'd say is sort of a high level policy input that this paper speaks to. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we are already out of time. There, there were still a couple of questions uh, pending. So I suggest to Laszlo, Halperon and myself to write an email to Dev with the remaining questions. So thank you so much, Dev, for this extremely interesting paper, beautiful theory, amazing application, uh, great work, yeah, congratulations. So this is the last GDTW of 2020. Uh, unfortunately, because the COVID situation is far from being solved, uh, we are going to be online also next term and we'll uh, publish the program soon. In the meantime, enjoy your Christmas break, your holidays, and see you next year. All the very best, thanks again. Thank you again. Bye.